Well, let me begin by summarizing very briefly some of Professor Summerfield's main points, but perhaps differently organized, I hope, to give us a different perspective. How did Darwin's geology influence the development of his grand theory of evolution by selective preservation of random variations? I think geology in particular, and his major travels, particularly the Beagle Voyage more generally, contributed several important things. First, it delivered evidence for transmutation. The question of whether transmutation of organisms actually occurred had been a hugely controversial subject for the preceding 60 or 70 years, really ever since before the time of Buffon in the mid-18th century. That species could change was evident to Darwin, first of all, from paleontological evidence that he found in the tertiary rocks of Argentina. He excavated the bones of uh, vertebrate creatures. He sent them home to London. They were subsequently analyzed by Richard Owen. And they recognized that many of these fossils represented life forms that were but modestly different than animals running around in Patagonia in the present day. Secondly, he adduced geographical evidence for transmutation by noticing that obviously closely related species, he was particularly interested in the rheas, ostrich-like birds, um, of southern South America. Different species opera operated in slightly different geographical areas or occupied somewhat different ecological niches. And he decided that these, these creatures must be related to each other and some process of transmutation had given rise to different species. His travels delivered evidence for adaptation, especially in the Galapagos Islands. Um, and actually, when he was in the Galapagos, it was not so much the eponymous finches as the mockingbirds that drew his attention. Um, he recognized four species. Uh, modern reclassification still maintains two of Darwin's original species. The others have been reclassified. But he recognized these as South American mockingbirds that had come to the Galapagos and by their occupation of different islands had taken up slightly different lifestyles and that had led to morphological changes um, that represented adaptations to the conditions on these islands. And so there was some powerful evidence planted in his mind. Most importantly, however, Darwin's geologizing raised the prospect of what we today call deep time. The notion that there were very, very long periods of Earth history available during which a process like evolution, as he sketched it, could have worked. He had before him the 8,000 meter peaks of the Andes, and he had direct evidence of the incremental meter scale stages by which such a great mountain range was erected over, he could easily work out time scales on the order of million, a million or millions of years. He had the, slow, the relatively slow growth of coral reefs before him. And he had the evidence of marine planation, which occurred imperceptibly. And thinking along those lines, he subsequently made his famous estimation of the um, millions of years time scale for the erosion of the weald of southeastern England. How did he assemble the pieces of his grand theory? Now, for a minute here, I'll depart from Professor Summerfield's comments. So I think the most important thing was his remarkable originality that Professor Dennett emphasized last evening. Professor Dennett's main point was his recognition that variation in life forms are essentially random. I think that doesn't mean so much until you put it together with a second thing that Darwin recognized, however, and that was that those random variations coupled with the selective effect of adaptation lead to progressive change over long periods of time. And therein lies the basis for evolution as opposed to simple random variation. I think as well Darwin's creative use of inference coupled with a willingness to speculate is evidence for great originality in Darwin. Speculation was strongly discouraged in early 19th century earth science. There had been an excess of speculative theories about the history of the Earth in the late 18th century, and beginning with the um, French anatomist Georges Cuvier, who was, I think it's fair to say, the dominant 
for a scientist of his time at the turn of the 19th century. Um, speculation on histories of the Earth was strongly discouraged. The founders of the Geological Society, which Darwin, to which Darwin was elected immediately upon his return from the Beagle Voyage, um, were men who considered that one should map the geology of the Earth and, and draw conclusions based on the evidence that was mapped, the things that they could see before them, the order of strata um, and the organization of those strata in the landscape. Both Herschel and Lyell, um, major scientific mentors of Darwin, uh, discouraged him from an excess of speculation. But really, in a, an important sense, Darwin made very important influences, inferences, I'm sorry, amongst the, the data that he collected and salted that with a considerable amount of very inspired speculation because he didn't really have any idea about the essential mechanism for random variations. That only came along um, 40 or 50 years later with the realization um, that genetics affects individuals. It needn't have been 40 years, I suppose, except that Mendel's work was buried in very obscure mid-European journals. Another very important thing, uh, returning to Professor Somerville's talk, was Darwin's use of a very wide circle of informants. Richard Owen, after Cuvier's death, the world's premier anatomist of his time. John Dalton Hooker on botanical affairs. His mentors, Cedric and Henslow, with whom he maintained correspondence for many, many years. John Herschel, his mentor in scientific method. And perhaps above all, Lyell, and, and later on, Andrew Crombie Ramsey, uh, geologists to whom he, he turned for, first of all, for mentorship, and later on for um, collegial discussion um, about his affairs, particularly his affairs in relation to the study of landscape. But quite beyond that, Darwin's remarkable correspondence with a wide range of animal breeders, particularly the, the pigeon breeders, um, and botanical um, selectors and, and developers of, of uh, horticultural variations in England, he took the evidence of these people who did selective breeding as, as essentially quasi-experiments in, in controlled um, variation, um, at a, a selective um, breeding that led to variations, not by random effects and adaptation, but by deliberate selection, um, but quasi-experiments that could give some clues to what must be the mysterious mechanism for variations to arise. Now, I'd like to think about these last two points in a bit more detail. That's the use of inference and the use of informants. Inference. I think Darwin's attitude comes out most clearly in his response to Hopkins. Um, a response that Professor Summerfield has already directly played to you. I believe that Hopkins is much opposed because his course of study has never led him to reflect much on such subjects as geographic distribution, classification, homologies, and etc. So he does not feel it a relief to have some kind of explanation. I think Darwin is here signaling, no doubt implicitly, um, I'm sure he didn't think in the terms I'm just about to use, I think he's recognizing that he, he's constructing a, what I will call a system science, a science of essentially complex interactions amongst many parts, not a science about fundamental simple building blocks of matter and energy such as physics and chemistry deal with, a science in which to abstract a part of the matter renders that matter dysfunctional. In this context, classical reductionism doesn't work too well. But such a science can be mounted on inference. And the modern environmental sciences, which in some senses Darwin was playing a role in, in establishing, do work largely that way. The root of this attitude, again, lies, I think, in Darwin's geology. Geology is, in a sense, a system science. And in the 19th century, it was especially so because the history of geology in the 19th century was a history of a of the search for the history of Earth, a search for an explanatory account of the development of the contemporary landscape. Think of Darwin's preoccupation with uplift and subsidence. And so it was largely inferential. We had one Earth, we have one set of contemporary evidence, and from that, by some means, um, 
by the application of knowledge of processes currently seen to be in operation. Lyle learned from, uh, sorry, Darwin learned from Lyle. Um, one had to try and construct a history of Earth based on evidence, but it would have to, of necessity, be largely an inferential history. In many respects, for example, the production of that quintessentially Earth science theory, the glacial theory, which was happening in the same years that Darwin was forming his evolutionary ideas, parallels the production of evolution in, in Darwin's mind. It was the same consilience of different lines of evidence leading to an inferential leap that yielded the theory. I think this is important for us to think about and to study today because we're dealing in a very important way with the sciences of the environment. Very important because we as dominant animals on the earth are changing the environment in very important ways. We've become the dominant factor in evolution itself on the surface of the earth. And if we're to understand what we're doing to earth and to save both earth and ourselves, I think we have to properly understand um, modes of study that are appropriate to what I'm calling system sciences. And I think there's some important lessons in Darwin's work for that. And the second issue is Darwin's circle of informants. And what strikes me as interesting about Darwin's circle of informants is the question, could an insight of Darwinian proportions be duplicated today? I'm skeptical. And that's because of the modern professionalization of science professionalization that's come with the proliferation of science. Darwin was a gentleman naturalist. He wasn't a pro. No one paid him to invent evolution. I think today specializations in science has largely closed off the possibility for us to use wide avenues of consultation. Oh yes, there's interdisciplinary study. Um, but interdisciplinary work today is nothing like so broad as it was in Darwin's time. Most of us would scarcely even think of the everyday experience of things, people like animal breeders and so on. There are language barriers within science that discriminate against the possibility for this sort of very broad consultation. There actually is something of an early 20th century parallel to uh, Darwin's work in the development of continental drift, which subsequently became the theory of plate tectonics. Um, Alfred Wegener, who first introduced the idea in a somewhat modern form, played a role somewhat like Alfred Russell Wallace, I suppose. And the British geologist Arthur Holmes, I suppose, was in a, in a diminished sense the Darwin of the episode. Um, but much like evolution was not cemented until 40 or 50 years later when the first inklings of genetic programming of organisms came along, plate tectonics didn't really take off until after the Second World War when geochemists, geophysicists, and tectonics people brought together the evidence, the consilience of which led to acceptance of the idea. So my opening question, I'm not sure it's an answerable one, uh, Mike, um, then, is, is really, is there a new and important grand theory out there about the workings of nature that we're no longer equipped to discover? Perhaps the more practical question to ask is, um, do we need to recover something of Darwin's breadth and Darwin's naivety, actually, in order to make major progress in science? Right, well, that's, um, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> it's perhaps difficult to envisage a, a larger scale question than that, but uh, I, I certainly take the point that this is just sort of total abundance of knowledge that is hard to he all became but everybody who was relatively interested um, in the history and the and supposed to make that opportunity for the time. Now, the location of the and the and the as we know, every time in China. And of course, the exposure and the science priest all became the first and last piece of the civil accuracy science faculty. We've got an enormous diversity in a lot of battle specialists looking at us. And the idea is that it's very difficult to explore this. Uh, if you have a specialist in one split, hard pressure on the other split, especially as there are things in science, which are much more complicated in the science humanities, it's not a different order. Or, or of uh, status. And uh, this, I think, also gives me a bit of a take on the point you were making about continental drift, as I, you, we did discuss this uh, uh, the other day, that in, in many ways, the, the, the sort of evidence that Darwin assembled in The Origin of Species about the fact of evolution having occurred, because it was a very powerful assemblage of all these different lines of evidence 
which made that argument. Uh, in some ways, in the first part of the 20th century, a powerful array of evidence was produced to show that continents must have moved around from such things as coastlines fitting together across the Atlantic Ocean to continuities of geological structures on either side of these coastlines across oceans from matching up uh, fossil evidence, matching up different, type, different rock types, different sedimentary units. And, you know, and, and, and interestingly, a group of particularly geologists in the southern hemisphere, such as Alexander Dutoy in South Africa, were absolutely convinced and based their, their whole view of geology on the fact of mobile continents. In fact, Dutoy wrote a book called Our Wandering Continents. Um, but this wasn't taken up as mainstream, and I think an important impediment to that wasn't, in the sense, just not enough evidence of it, but again, the role of a mathematical modeling approach to things as opposed to an approach which looks at a, a set of different lines of evidence which all seem to be pointing in the same direction. And the key figure here, in, in, we could substitute for Hopkins, Harold Jeffries, who, who was a, a geophysicist at Cambridge, who, when Wegener suggested his idea of mobile continents, uh, worked out that it was plainly impossible that solid crust could move through other solid material and therefore continents simply couldn't move around. The forces required simply weren't available. Um, um, so it was a case of a mathematical calculation based on what we now know must have been erroneous assumptions because clearly continents do move around and we have uh, uh, convincing mechanisms for how that comes about. So the uh, modelling based on the assumptions trumped this whole assemblage of what we might call circumstantial uh, uh, evidence. Um, and so that, that sort of conflict of methodology also, I think, makes people working between disciplines sometimes uh, rather more difficult. So I've managed to talk there for about three or four minutes without in any way actually <laughs> addressing your question. Maybe I should go into politics. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Thank you. There are two microphones, and people are invited to come to the microphones and address questions to Professor Summerfield, or I expect I'm fair game as well, aren't I? Well, I believe so, <laughs> yes. They are, they are there. <laughs> yes. So you talked originally uh, about uh, the dissatisfaction with people who speculated. And to a degree, a hypothesis is a speculation, but most of our hypotheses are some kind of supported speculation. And when Darwin produced his theory, his grand theory, there was an awful lot about it that he didn't know, and so it was, in a sense, speculative. And yet, 30 years beforehand, uh, you're saying John Herschel and others, uh, well, not John Herschel, but maybe some others, are very much against speculation. So what was happening in those 30 years to transform science into something that is much closer to what we practice today? From my part, I think my answer would be that I'm, I'm not sure that anything very radical was happening. Um, Darwin's theory of evolution when after it was first introduced did not immediately receive very widespread support. Certainly he had his enthusiastic supporters um, in Britain and particularly in Germany on the continent, but they were by no means necessarily a majority of, of naturalists, thinkers and savants. It wasn't really until the turn of the 20th century that there was a decided turn towards Darwin. Now, there were other ideas about um, the relationships of organisms and the possible evolution of organisms or the organization of the animal and plant kingdoms running around, of course, a number of competing theories, and some of them held sway uh, over Darwin's theory for some time. And part of the reason for that is because the central part of Darwin's theory did seem to be pure speculation. He simply didn't know what the mechanism could be. And, and the audacity of, of the, the, the core assumption as Professor Dennett showed last night, the notion that variations were random seemed to fly in the face of, of, of all reason to the people of the time. Yes, I think on that point in terms of sort of two aspects of, of, of addressing that question, but the, 
in terms of uh, the speculation involved in proposing the mechanism of natural selection as an explanation of evolution. I think it's probably quite important, I'm sure actually David Livingston probably knows a lot more about this particular thing than, than certainly I do. Um, it's an important distinction, I think, to be made between the impact the origin of species made on people because of the convincing array of evidence he presented that organic evolution had occurred as opposed to the mechanism that Darwin was suggesting for how it had occurred. So, of course, Darwin came up with this mechanism, and the book is structured in this way, that first he demonstrates what is fairly obvious to people, that artificial selection by, you know, by breeders, um, that's why the book starts off with a discussion of pigeons, um, then he goes on to present how this could occur naturally and presenting natural selection. Then the rest of the book is going through these series of arguments supporting the fact that evolution itself ha has occurred. Uh, but my understanding is that whilst the book progressively convinced quite a lot of people that evolution had occurred, the role of natural selection in producing that organic evolution was always dubious from the beginning and actually tended to fade away. And indeed Darwin, through successive editions of the origins, rode back somewhat from natural selection as the, as, as the sole mechanism. And of course it wasn't until eventually Mendel's work was incorporated and the development of the new synthesis uh, where there was a sort of clear um, link between natural selection as the mechanism for evolution. Um, on, on the sort of notion about what happened between the founding of the Geological Society and, and, and later on, I think maybe, I mean, my, my reading of this, and I believe actually even in almost like the constitution of the Geological Society when it was founded in 1807, it's something you would use the word like it eschewed uh, pure speculation because there had to be many of these speculative schemes put forward in the 18th century. But they were speculative because they were often trying to infer what the interior of the Earth was like because this was, of course, a great mystery. You could see the surface, but you didn't know what was going on in the interior. Um, but I, my understanding was that the, really the attitude was, well, you can't just have speculation. You can make a speculation on something, but you have to have some clear evidence to support it. So I'm not sure it was such a kind of black and white uh, distinction, perhaps, as that. So, um, um, but clearly Dar Darwin does use, you know, he, he, he says different things. I mean, when talking about developing his, uh, the origin of species, he talks about once having the idea, I think in his autobiography, he started systematically collecting facts in a pure inductive Baconian way. Um, but that really wasn't sort of quite how it worked because he had, the, it was a, a, a sort of great deduction for when he then just had evidence to gather. But interestingly in the coral reef thing, he makes a big play of how deductive that was that he had a guess at the mechanism before in a sense he'd actually physically seen coral reefs, but because he knew a lot from what he'd read and maps of, of what they were basically like. So I think with the Herschel view, there's a bit of deduction and a bit of induction all the time going on in, in, in some sort of balance. I was struck by your observation that uh, in the development of his methodology, there's this, this suggestion that um, there can be fundamental change from a sequence of small increments. Um, obviously something that's relevant to, uh, to evolution. And I wondered if Darwin had speculated on the age of the Earth and more generally what was known at that time about that question. Um. Well, we, I mean, there was the calculation he did, which you mentioned about this, this thing about the wheel, the Kent, the, the, his, his vision of how much material had been removed there and how long it would take. And I'm not going to know the exact figures here, but I think I recall he came up with an estimate of 300 million years uh, originally for the amount of time that it would have taken to erode back these escarpments to their present position. Uh, that then he had to, uh, that, that kind of estimate was quite severely attacked and he had to sort of retract that. And of course he was actually assuming that that erosion was occurring by marine erosion. Um, it was quite a common thing at that time to regard rivers as being rather uh, uh, weak agents of erosion compared with wave action. I suppose just generally if you've got waves they appear more energetic. 
Um, even though, in fact, Darwin did collect, so I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm not quite sure whether it's in The Origin of the Species, but it's either that or in the Worm Book, where he does actually mention data about the amount of sediment that the Mississippi River is carrying, for instance. So he, he, he is sort of aware of, of that. Um, but there were various other estimates. I mean, Cuvée, I think, had an estimate um, of some few million years. But I think the 300 million years, probably when Darwin suggested origin species, would have been regarded as a, as a rather enormous uh, uh, period of time. And, and what's, what's the right answer? That could have been, that could have been within the age of the Earth anyway, because the rock the erosion that Darwin was making the guesses for had to have been deposited in the Earth rock. So Darwin was by inference that the Earth was much more than 300 million years ago. Once again, in fact, uh, since it's been riding to the wreckage, um, <laughs> William Thompson, Lord Kelvin, who had been tutored by Hopkins, in fact, ironically, yeah. Decided from what he knew about the induction in the materials and the character of those materials, worked out that it was not possible for the Earth to be older than somewhere between 20 million and his initial estimate of 1862, right after the origin came out, was about 400 million years. He thought it was closer to 20. And he subsequently obtained further information about the production of those materials and decided that the Earth couldn't possibly be more than 100 million years old. And this is, in fact, one of the principal reasons for considerable skepticism about Darwin's theory, even in scientific circles, until the end of the 19th century, when, of course, radioactivity was discovered. And, and mm. what, what is the best guess now about the age of the Earth? Well, it's 4.5 billion years. 4.5 billion. Sorry? I, I'm sorry, what, is, what did you say? 4.5 billion, well, 4.55 billion years old. So four and a half billion years old. Anyone else? No? Well, in that case, uh, let me wrap things up for this evening. First of all, thank you all for coming out tonight, and I invite you very warmly to return tomorrow night for the third in our series of Darwin Week lectures, which will be given by Professor David Livingston from Queen's University in Belfast, uh, with the title, Putting Darwinism and Religion in Their Place. And uh, I'll conclude by uh, thanking Professor Michael Summerfield and Professor uh, Michael Church for a very engaging uh, discussion this evening and a wonderful lecture. And on behalf of Carleton University, we have small gifts for you. Mm. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.